Well, I'm Rose Fellings, for those of you that don't know, and I've just come back about a couple of weeks ago from this conference in Fort Lauderdale. So I'm going to just run through some of the important stuff as briefly as possible. So that's what I've been to, and I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to just go through very briefly um, some of the things that were summarised at the end by Dr Tony Komaroff. This um, conference lasted about five days, so it was pretty gruelling because the Americans work very long hours and, you know, we started out straight after breakfast about half past seven and there were often things on all evening as well and you barely break for lunch and morning tea or anything civilised like that. So it's all go. Um, and then at the very end, after all these many, many presentations from all around the world, Dr. or Professor Tony Komaroff, who is um, Professor of Medicine at Harvard, um, he always summarises the conference brilliantly in about half an hour. So I've actually got bits off his slides and I'm going to try and do the same, but my level of competence probably won't be anything like as great as his but I'll get through what I can and just buzz through really and it's a bit here there and everywhere it doesn't necessarily follow an exact sequence um, but he talked briefly about the IOM report and we'd had quite a lot of this at the conference and the final con the IOM is the Institute of Medicine which is a great big organization in America and they had had a meeting last year of all the gurus and to come up with a report and you probably a lot of you read it they wanted to call it SEID which is systemic exercise intolerance disease but people have been feeling that's not very um, suitable as a name and they're going to stick to the CFS stroke ME but hope to gradually call it ME because that seems to be now um, more medically scientifically correct but the, the things that came out was that it's definitely a biologically based illness no longer can anyone say it's all in your head although it is all in your head because it's very brain related but it's not as psychologically in your head they are encouraging and planning much more research and they're going to be pouring much more money into research which is really good news and there's a great thrust now for medical education um, not just in America but internationally and I'm on a committee with a number of other people and we meet on Skype about once a month looking at how we can educate doctors in different parts of the world so that's all good news coming out of that um, they then talked a lot during the conference about what we call post-exertional malaise which is considered the absolute key symptom for this illness you know there wouldn't be a person around with this illness who didn't suffer from this and if they don't suffer from this they probably don't have the illness um, it's a, extreme fatigue which lasts for up to three days and may be delayed in its onset um, and it's triggered off either by a lot of physical activity or by what we call cognitive or brain activity um, so you know you might be sitting at your computer or writing a report or something and that's just as exhausting as the um, physically trying to go for a run and the symptoms of course are very familiar to many of you here fatigue mental problems you know not mental mental crazy problems but mental processing problems sleep disturbance headaches myalgia which is muscle pain and flu-like symptoms and these are the core symptoms of the illness which most people will have to some degree or another but that's what we when we talk post-exertional malaise we're not talking just tiredness we're talking that set of symptoms or at least a high percentage of those symptoms um, and it's caused or they've now identify genes in your um, actually do change and express changes um, which are brought on by exercise so they actually can see what's going on and most people will have what we call tachycardia which is an increased heart rate and um, 
sometimes the heart rate and the second test that they do, they do to, to test people for this, and I think Lynette might well be talking about it, they do two tests, one on day one, and then 24 hours later or so, another test. And so they notice changes in people with CFS, which are quite different to healthy or sporty people. And there's less ability to consume oxygen properly on the second day. And the buildup of lactic acid, or what we call lactate, um, is much, much higher in people with this illness than the people who are the healthy people. And overall, people with chronic fatigue syndrome build up more of this lactate than they ought to be. Now, I'm just summarizing a summary, if you like. So, you know, there's much more detail in all the different papers that were produced. So we're just going to go through um, immunology, which is the study of your immune system. And we know that this is an illness which is focused very much on immune system abnormalities. They have shown in a lot of the research over the last 20 years that this is a disorder principally of your immune system or your body's fighting force. And the cytokines are the chemicals your body produces to help fight infection. So you've got two arms of infection fighting. One is the cytokines and the other is the cells that actually fight infection, the white blood cells and other types of cells. And what they've found in this condition that out of 51 different cytokines, and there are many more than that, but they looked particularly at 51 of them, 15 were very, very different consistently in people with this illness. And most of these cytokines are what we call pro-inflammatory. They're associated with some sort of inflammation. And so the symptoms you get are very much of an inflammatory nature. And many people say, well, I felt like I was getting flu whenever I had a relapse. And that's because there's this sort of inflammatory response. And that inflammatory response occurs in the brain as well. So you get a turn on of um, inflammatory cells in the brain called microglia. And that's what makes people feel very ill um, again, as if they were getting a bad dose of the flu or glandular fever or something like that. And what they found is that these cytokines, they've measured them um, depending on the severity of illness that different people have, right from bed bound through to people who are just about hanging in and out at work. And they found that the abnormalities in the cytokines depend on the severity of the illness, which again shows it's tied in with the illness. Um, so the very severely ill have far greater abnormalities than the people who are only um, a little bit ill. Um, then they looked at the B cells, which are a type of white cell. And you've probably heard something about the research that's been going on in Norway, where they're looking at this drug we call rituximab. Rituximab is a drug used to treat lymphoma, which is a type of cancer. And they found that in chronic fatigue syndrome, it does have some benefit and a lot of research is now going on with that. Um, but rituximab is a drug, drug that quietens down these B cells, this particular type of white cell. And they found that the, the B cells in this condition are really quite abnormal. Um, they talk about increased clonality. Uh, this Japanese research, and that's the way the B cells proliferate and grow and develop. And they found that's where the abnormalities in this particular type of illness are. Um, then they talked a lot about what we call the microbiome. And this is something you're going to hear about more and more. The microbiome is the large sort of sea of bacteria that's throughout your intestinal tract. Um, and the microbiome being the environment, and you sometimes hear them referred to as the microbiota, which are the actual bugs. And there's 10 times as many bacteria in the gut as there are human cells throughout your whole body. So that's quite an amazing sort of statistic. 
and they found at least five to eight million different genes residing in your gut associated with all these cells. And this is a very important part of it. You don't want to wash all these bacteria away because they are balanced in such a way that your gut functions normally, if they are balanced correctly, and you're, it's very much in conduct, in, in, uh, you know, with your brain, contact with your brain, um, and it's all part of your immune system. And your gut is lined with immune cells, and so the bacteria interact with the immune cells and send messages to your brain, which then um, determines how you. Um, react, how you feel, and so there's this interplay going on all the time and these bacteria actually help to make hormones and what we call neurotransmitters which are the chemicals that help the nerves function correctly um, and they make the molecules of inflammation, they sort of give, make the cells that fight infection and so on. So this whole microbiome is a hugely important part and I mean the research in this field of chronic fatigue syndrome is just moving on at such a rapid rate it's, rate, it's almost unbelievable. Um, what they found though in people with chronic fatigue syndrome in their microbiome or their microbiota the, the cells themselves are very unbalanced and there are not as many different types of bacteria as there ought to be and they are sort of imbalanced as well and they've also found quite a lot of viruses there's these chordovirals and bacteriophage virals which actually live off bacteria like little parasites and all this is going on unbeknown to us really i mean we just go to the loo and poo and that's it isn't it but all this is actually going on and in people with chronic fatigue syndrome because of the imbalances um, there's quite a lot of um, inflammatory change going on and this is probably why so many people with this illness do suffer from irritable bowel syndrome very much hand in hand. Um, so there's much more focus now on what's going on in the gut than there ever used to be. Um, and all this is getting, for the gurus who are in it, very, very exciting. Um, then there were quite a lot of um, um, sessions on the brain and central nervous system. And these are just one or two or three or four of the papers that were discussed. They found for sure that people with this illness definitely have very slow processing of information generally, uh, particularly as they get more tired, uh, the post-exertional malaise thing. So everything in the brain is a bit on go slow. And particularly with children, this was very significant. A lot of the research has been done in Melbourne by Dr. Rowe, who was over here last year, um, and they found, or year before last, I think, they found that um, with children, they were very hard to stay attending. And, you know, this is why these kids at school are often labelled as lazy or naughty. Um, and then if they're pushed out to exercise, which, of course, sometimes they are, it's part of being at school, their attention span and everything else gets a lot worse and they're very, very, you know, mentally disabled or cognitively disabled because of all this. Um, then another study showed that the brain blood flow is very, very sluggish in general in people with this. They use all sorts of different scanning, PET scans and SPECT scans and MRIs and you name it, I'm lost with much of it. Um, but they found that the brain blood flow is very sluggish and again it gets worse with exercise whereas the healthy person who goes out exercising their brain blood flow actually increases so quite the opposite of what happens to um, healthy people and there's a lot of focus at this conference on what they call glutathione which is a chemical that um, gets into many of your cells and in particular your brain cells and glutathione is considered to be very important and it certainly is implicated in uh, brain function and they found that it's definitely 
kind of way down in many people in this illness. Um, and then they looked at the cerebrospinal fluid. People are always thinking I've spelt it wrong and it should be CFS, but it's CSF. Um, and they found when they look at the uh, cerebrospinal fluid, which is the fluid that su surrounds your brain and spinal cord, that the white cell count is much higher than it should be, which is indicative of indication, inflammation. And there are far more different types of proteins in that fluid than there ought to be. And then they also looked at the vagal nerve, which sort of transmits from the brain and it controls your heart rate and things like your breathing. Um, and they found that the vagal activity is down, so the whole heart rate isn't controlled in the way it ought to be, which helps to explain why so often people say their heart races or it seems to miss beats and do funny things. Um, they also looked at the actual electrical impulses moving around in the brain. I mean, your brain is just a seething mass of electricity, really controlled by chemistry. And they found that the actual movement of, you know, electrical impulses through your brain is very, very sluggish and slow. Um, and as I said just now, they used all sorts of different brain techniques. Um, now, epigenetics, that's a new one. Um, I really was a bit lost when we moved into the genes stuff, as everyone was. It's, you know, the science is getting so intense. But epigenetics is talking about how genes express themselves. <coughs> and genes are expression is, um, you know, the gene changes and it sort of sends messages, I suppose, through to the body. I mean, this is making it terribly simplistic because it's so incredibly scientific that most people can't understand it at all. But um, this is what happens. The genes express themselves and as they express themselves, different things happen in our body. And some of this expression is known as mutation. The genes actually change a lot in the way they function and their structure and what have you. Um, but they found this, it's not just the genes that have changed their sort of way of acting, but even the healthy genes um, may be just not working properly. So the genes that are affected are on the one hand causing major problems, but even the healthy genes are causing problems. And it's caused by all manner of different, what they call epigenetic forces. And the studies are coming through thick and fast. The first day before the conference even began, we had a day up at the University of, uh, of Nova University in Florida it was called, which is where Professor Nancy Klimas and Professor Mary Ann Fletcher have their laboratories and they are among the high powered researchers in these fields. And they have a huge team and they put on this one day seminar for us, which most of us sat there in sort of like another language almost. You could barely follow, but at the same time you could sort of follow. And it was really, really interesting. But they have this huge team of about 30 people working in all these different facets of this study. Um, and they found so many different patterns of gene activity and, you know, it's mind boggling. It really is. Um, and they would talked a lot there about what they, we call GWI, which is Gulf War illness. And these are the um, veterans who've returned from the Gulf War, uh, American mainly, but also some British, French, and I think even Australian. And a very, very high percentage of these mainly men, but some women came back with illness, um, which is probably due to a number of factors, not the least being stress and many immunizations that they had to have in a hurry. Exposure now they know to things like sarine gas and other toxic gases and wearing hot suits in a very hot climate and also being exposed to a lot of bacteria and other bugs they'd never been exposed to before. So it stands to reason a lot of people came back ill, but a very high percentage of them have remained ill long term. And the illness is very much 
parallel and similar to chronic fatigue syndrome is probably the same thing really but because the American government of course have poured money into all this research this has spilt over into the CFS research area and so Nancy and her team are working very much in all this and there's a lot of work going on looking at possible treatments for Gulf War illness which if they finally as it were get there in the treatment field, this will all obviously spill over into the whole chronic fatigue syndrome world. They talk a lot about methylation, which is just another series of chemical activities. Um, they've found that these um, chemical activities are definitely abnormal in CFS and again, it correlates with the clinical symptoms. So the more sick the person is, the more ab abnormal these chemical reactions are. And then there's a lot of talk now about what they call micro RNAs. Again, if you had Warren Tate here, he'd be bouncing up and down with excitement because it's very much his field of work. Um, and they've found one particular study that was reported that two particular micro RNAs, and I mean, there are thousands of them, so you know, they're picking out, but they found these two um, led to what they call an elevation of a chemical in your system called homocysteine. Now you may think, oh yeah, well, what does that mean? I found that quite exciting because all the time I'm getting patients who benefit from B12 injections. You know, not every patient, but they say about 70% get some benefit from B12 injections. And you always come up against um, other researchers and medical people who say, oh, you know, it's all a lot of waste of time. Surely the B12 can't be making people feel as well as they are. Are they imagining it? Is it a placebo effect? But in fact, this little bit of research gives us good indication to use B12 quite legitimately because when you've got elevated homocysteine, it almost always means that the B12 level, possibly in the brain, um, is depleted and therefore you're justified in using B12 <coughs> as a trial anyway to see if you happen to have a patient who might respond positively and well. Um, the epigenetic stuff just went on and on, you know, all day sort of thing, and we all got rather overwhelmed. But this particular research matches, this top one, matches what the team in the Gold Coast found in some of their work last year, no, earlier this year when I went to London, they reported that they had got the breakthrough with the um, biomarker or the test that people might be able to have to prove that they've got the illness. And they talk about these SNAPs, which are single nucleotide polymorphisms, if you want to know the name, but these are little building blocks that are all associated with your immune system and um, the three that were identified um, earlier on this year when I heard them speak from the Gold Coast um, were very, very different from any other um, work that had been done before. And I think this piece of research here, which was by some Americans, is certainly uh, replicating what they're finding. And that, of course, is what you have to have in research. You have to have the whole thing repeated by another team um, because it's no good someone coming up and saying, oh, we've found this and that's the end of story. That's the beginning of the story. And I think it was quite significant that Nancy Klimas actually said, when you get an idea that this might be something worth researching, it takes you two years to bring the idea together to a point where you can, with your team, apply for some funding. And then when you get the funding, I mean, research is hugely expensive. When you get the funding, it might be another year before you actually get that. So there's three years gone 
from when you start the idea and then it's going to be at least another three years before you complete the research. So any new idea takes a lot of time and other teams have to be replicating it too to make sure it's genuine. And so this is a sort of bit of a replication really of what was reported from the Gold Coast. Um, the last one again there is microRNAs. Um, and they are these little bits of the um, genes, really. And they found some in the spinal fluid in some patients. And those patients had a lot more trouble with what we call orthostatic tachycardia, a very, very rapid heartbeat if they um, exercise or stand up suddenly. Um, so that, again, there's some proof of what is actually going on. Um, some talk about energy metabolism. That is um, pretty obvious, really, the, the sort of metabolism that goes on associated with energy. And the, we've got this drug rituximab that's being widely investigated, particularly in Europe. Um, but they've got this pool of patients now, you see, who've been gathered for that trial. So they can start to do other tests on these patients while they're waiting, as it were. And they found that there was a definite what they call metabolic defect. In other words, um, the metabolism was not working as efficiently as it ought to be. And they think it's due to the um, patients who were tested producing some autoantibodies. And autoantibodies are kind of self-destructive um, cells, really. And they also found the white cells were just not as efficient and good as they ought to be, um, particularly if the person was under stress. Now, we know always that stress, be it physical or mental, affects the way our bodies work. And um, certainly this was, again, just actually showing it in the flesh in something um, definite. Um, now, we've got this work that came uh, just a few months before the conference, a man called Navio, in, uh, associated with Stanford University, who said that he had found all sorts of changes in the metabolism or the metabolites, metabolomic metabolomic changes um, in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. They'd looked at a very, very um, large number of tests on a few patients, not all that many patients, because each test they do costs 70,000 US dollars. So you can imagine the amount of money that is needed for research. And this is partly because the equipment they're using is so high tech and so expensive. But anyway, this Navio man did a lot of this work. Um, and he found these things, which I won't go into, um, but the bottom line is that MECFS is what they call a hypometabolic state. He found particular abnormalities in the body chemistry, which indicated almost a state like hibernation, um, which may not seem such a strange thing to some of you who have this illness, that you almost feel like you're a hibernating animal. Um, but the things that I found very, very interesting here was that probably 15, 20 years ago maybe, but at least 15 years ago, I was quite involved with a team of uh, biochemists at um, Newcastle University in uh, New South Wales. Um, and they were doing a lot of work looking at things like the citric acid metabolism, the fatty acids, amino acids, huge amount of work they were doing. And it was exciting for a while, but like so many things in research, I think maybe they didn't have enough money or maybe they ran out of ideas, but it sort of stayed. Nothing much happened. And these researchers, who I have kept in touch with over time, carried on. They moved around a little bit, and two of them are now in Melbourne. Um, they carried on, and they. one of them was a... Um, he looked at the feces, the stools, and so he was looking at the microbiome way back then. The others were biochemists. And honestly, what they were saying back then 
is now finally being confirmed. And Neil McGregor, who was one of that original team, was there in Florida. And, you know, it was very obvious that what they had done 15 years or so ago was actually what they're now finally saying, well, yes, that's actually true. And what you did was real, but no one else sort of picked up on the research. So that's kind of very interesting, the way things happen. <laughs> Um, and I think Neil McGregor, who's the one who did all this um, originally, he's going to be publishing a lot more research that they've since done. So that'll be the next level and that'll be really interesting. Finally, I won't talk for much longer, there are a few other studies that were interesting. They talked about strain, um, you know, it was kind of a funny word to use really, but they found that a lot of people who just sat maybe for half an hour or an hour actually began to sometimes get this post-exertional malaise or if they um, were driving you know and they're kind of resting on the one hand but active um, so even what you could almost call passive activities could cause post-exertional malaise. You know, you're holding your muscles while you're sitting in a chair and so on. And they found that a lot of people who had the so-called reaction to what they describe as strain, it's a bit of a strong word to use, but often going to a physio and getting some help with massage and loosening up your muscles and joints was a very good thing to consider. Um, well, I won't talk about the next one. I'm not quite sure what anti-citrullinated protein antibodies are, but anyway, apparently you are putting out autoantibodies possibly against your own proteins in your body. This is again little snippets of research, but they were considered important pointers to what might be now picked up on by somebody else um, to do more research on. And that one at the bottom is again, harping back to the Australian research on the Gold Coast where they found these abnormalities in the immune system um, that are very considered very important and potential biomarkers. Um, John Chia, he's always at these conferences. He's a gastroenterologist from Los Angeles um, and he's work has always been focused on finding these enteroviruses in the stomach and intestines and um, he does a lot of work, very, very good work and he's now isolated these enteroviruses from the brains of people with chronic fatigue syndrome. It's just another virus that might be implicated and he's working very strongly on antiviral agent. Um, he uses a herb called oxymetrine, um, which is said to destroy the virus and he markets it. Um, and he's not making huge money out of it. I tell you that now all the money goes into the research, but um, you know, he's on to something for certain patients that is seemingly very helpful. Um, Kennedy Merlier from Belgium, he's always been on about H2S, which is hydrogen sulfide. Um, he feels there's definitely dysregulation there. And again, now research by other people is showing that yes, there is. And hydrogen sulfide is a pretty toxic substance. And in some ways your system is not functioning properly. So you're kind of accumulating it a bit. And then another woman found, again, a sort of little piece of research in the background, really, um, that was considered quite ex important, that a lot of patients with this illness get sinusitis and hives and other things. And those patients have a great allergy tendency, but they also happen to experience pain more intensely. Um, well, what about diagnostic tests? This is something that everybody wants to get finalised. Which one are we going to be using? Is it going to be a combination? But as uh, we know, the important thing is that every lab needs to be able to do it, or not every lab, but many labs need to be able to do it reliably. You don't want too many 
what we call false positives or false negatives in other words saying yes you've got diabetes when you haven't you know it's that kind of thing and they need to look at many many other illnesses with fatigue as the or the post-exertional malaise thing um, and also compare it to people who are healthy and of course it must be very inexpensive because for example there's no way our government's going to be picking up the tab um, for a very expensive test. Um, these four things Nancy Klimas's lab have been working on and various other immune labs for a long time and they seem to be very consistently abnormal. They are cytokines and types of white cell counts and things like that. Navio we've mentioned the metabolomic stuff and the hibernation sort of thing. The Gold Coast study um, these are the ones with the SNAPs where the genes are very definitely abnormal, seemingly so um, not occurring in any other illness they've looked at and they do have the equipment on the Gold Coast, they seem to have plenty of money there to do tests on all sorts of diseases. And then Marianne Fletcher who's an old researcher now, she works alongside Nancy Klimas and um, she actually spoke and she explained that she was actually the person who originally discovered the test that we now use for glandular fever. So she's a real pioneer immunologist and we're talking many years ago now, but she's working on these two substances, neuropeptide Y and leptin. She feels very convinced that they are the keys to a diagnostic test um, again, she's looking at other illnesses and all the rest of it. Um, there was not a lot on treatment, sadly, um, partly because the research needs to move on to fuller understanding before treatment's going to be the big thrust. But there were a few things. NAC is known as, you can um, get that. It um, improves the glutathione in the brain, which you might remember from 10 minutes ago, I said was um, seriously down. Um, they used in one study methylphenidate, which is Ritalin, uh, with a lot of nutritional medicines, um, supplements and things like this. This was a big study done in Utah. And people did improve but no greater improvement than if they'd been on the Ritalin alone without all the extra supplements. So it's probable that Ritalin alone is useful for some people. Um, there was very good proof, really, that this illness is not all in the mind and just because you're thinking you're ill, you know. Um, using cognitive behavioural therapy wasn't necessarily the answer. And they also found, however, that physiotherapy was particularly useful for young people with this illness at keeping them mobilised and keeping their joints active and so on. And then there were the Norwegian lot who are doing this wonderful research on the two drugs, rituximab and cyclophosphamide. These are both chemotherapy drugs. They're getting some good results in their initial studies, but the whole thing is blinded at the moment because the patients are on these drugs and there will be sort of a set who are on one and a set who are on a blank dummy pill, if you like, or dummy infusion, um, and nobody knows which is on which, and even the doctors doing the trial don't know, so it's a properly blinded trial, and the results will be re unwrapped, as they say, from rituximab in October 2017 and the cyclophosphamide trial in probably about April. Um, the difference being rituximab is relatively free of any unpleasant side effects. Effects. Cyclophosphamide is heavy with nasty chemotherapy side effects, but they are thinking great potential with both drugs for patients with this. And this is what he finished off by saying, um, there is now robust evidence of an underlying biological process involving the brain, 
autonomic nervous system, immune system, energy, oxidative and so on, stress. So this is Professor Komarov who's a really big noise um, and he also says it's not simply an expression of physical symptoms by people with a primary psychological disorder. In other words, it's a very real, genuine illness and now classified by the World Health Organization, of course, as a neurological illness. So all in all, the whole thing was exciting and good. Um, so any questions? Yeah. Um, aside from the, the different gene expressions that CFS people have, uh, which obviously you could have right from birth and things to cause of the symptoms, is there a sense of what is mediating or sort of keeping the, the negative symptoms going in your body? Right. Okay, well, I don't know if you all heard, but this man wonders if there's any reason that keeps all this gene abnormality going. That's what you meant, really, was it? Something, yeah, something. something like that. Um, they know for sure that the majority of people with this illness probably have inherited a vulnerability. So they, they know for sure that we inherit the genetic vulnerability to get many, many diseases, all of us, and you know this is just one of them. And I think if you inherit the vulnerability, you know, you're kind of a sitting duck, as it were, um, but there then needs to be something in the way of an onslaught, which is almost always going to be an infection to trigger the whole thing off. Okay, having had it triggered off by an infection, you know, you get this pouring forth of immune system chemicals, the so-called cytokines. Probably the whole thing is being controlled by the microbiome, they think, um, and that's what sort of keeps it, as it were, activated. But with the right kind of management, and again, they say, you know, if you can get people early on, um, the right kind of management, things should simmer down slowly, though for many people they don't. But I think the understanding of what's going on now is very much more secure than it ever used to be. We're still not there, but, you know, it's moving. Yeah. I'm just wondering, with the microbiome, um Stuff. Was there any talk or any research on fecal transplants? Fecal, this lady asked about fecal transplants, which means basically putting someone's poo from one person to another, but it's not really quite like that. Um, but what, yes, there is work going on in that area. Um, it's all done under strict conditions of, you know, sterility and clinically properly done or it should be there are probably people who are doing it a bit you know on their side there um, but I know for example Henry Butt who is a bowel specialist <laughs> in uh, Melbourne he's part of that original team from Newcastle his work has been very much on the components of the stools and the microbiome and his work is very much you know showing up what is now being shown elsewhere and so on and I think members of his team are experimenting with faecal transplants and there are a few researchers around different parts of the world looking at that possibility because it's a potential for sure um, we know one thing that's quite interesting regarding the uh, microbiome is that you inherit your microbiome from your mother and you pick up the bugs that form the basis of your bowel contents as you are being born through the vaginal canal. And if you're born by caesarean section, you don't have that exposure. And what they're now doing is um, well, feeding's the wrong word, giving these babies um, who've been born by caesarean samples of their mother's um, faecal bacteria so that they actually do acquire them, you know, instead of having acquired them going through the vaginal passage. So we know for sure how, you know, having the right balance is terribly important and it varies a little bit in different parts of the world and depending on different dietary style and different racial characteristics and so on but you know follow on from faecal transplant that's what they're doing with newborn babies so that's common practice now is that what you're saying that if you have a cesarean your baby will... well i wouldn't say it's being practiced here it's being practiced in research to see if it's right. you know going to be relevant and important
Does that mean that um, another has um, not only the sort of leaders burst through the uh, vaginal uh, canal, um, does that mean that they're going to pass on the well, I think the um, if you're not born vaginally, you don't pass on the microbiome, okay? Mm -hmm. If you're born vaginally, you do, but that's not necessarily related to the autoantibodies, which are part of your blood system, okay? There we are. That's what I got. You can come and look at it afterwards. But, um, it was very embarrassing because I had to produce, you know, one of these acceptance speeches. It was like being a film star on the Golden Globes or something. But anyway, you can have a look afterwards.